Look at this, how he balances the things. He has so many bags. All right, are we walking? Don't help or anything. Don't speak up. I have a uh, nitro cold brew with one stevia because I have a tendency to get hot easily. Postmodern is being self-referential and, and not just self, but to what wrestling is and what exists. And a lot of time wrestling parodies things. You know, if there's a baseball strike, there'll be a baseball wrestler and whatever. My goal is to try to not sweat today. We're at this point where there's so much wrestling and sometimes I feel like I'm the only wrestler who is self-aware that he's actually in a wrestling show. This is, uh, in many ways, I think a last resort. Is this the tavern? Okay. You can say, I'm here, I know I'm here, I'm looking around, I see these cameras, why are we pretending that they're not there? I would like to see the shot right now. Flip the thing, flip it. Okay, uh, well, fucking whatever. Here we are, okay. Oh, what is this? I should just say this thing curled all the way around, you didn't say anything? I wanted to get a nice steady stream going, but I guess that's what, that's what we got. I'm not one for, oh, Lord. Okay, can we, I should have brought a napkin. It's People now have expressions that indicate what the past eight months have been to them. You'll say if you say if you're talking to a neighbor and they go, and blah 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 blah, and we had that all planned, but with all that's going on, that that little moment there is like your pandemic expression. I am interested to see how this generation connects with each other the same way that my mother will hold it over my head that I didn't go through the seventies. You weren't there. You didn't know. I, I look forward to saying, it was a pandemic, we all had webcams. Things sound less, the action of things is less now, they make less noises and it sucks. When you got into a fight on the phone, on the old hang up phone, ba 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 fuck you, boom, period. And then they switch to those those phones in the house with just the, the beep, the, you know, the little beep. It's like, blah, 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 blah. and it's like, beep. And now uh, there's nothing. Also, what bothers me is people talk like this. Walking down the street, they talk like this. Nobody does this anymore because the speaker is in here now, right? They go like this and they go like this. That's not a, and they won't even be on speakerphone. They'll just be talking like this. I don't know. I got a lot of grievances. Well, any industry that I was really a part of has for the most part, vanished. Um, which I was thinking about, and th and there are some like real positive side effects to it emotionally. I don't have uh, FOMO. People talk about FOMO a lot, fear of of missed opportunities, because like it's not like I'm being left out. Everyone is being left out. It seems that the pandemic has alleviated. Um, Part of my anxiety because so much of anxiety is creating fear or dread or danger when there is none right anxiety is like when you're driving and you're just driving downtown and then your brain just starts spinning scenarios in your head to me that's like true true anxiety when there's nothing going on i think a part of the reason I do like wrestling and I do like comedy and doing improv and stand up. They all seem to have a little tightrope where like this could go well, this could go pretty shitty. 
um, is because it demands all of my focus. At that moment, I'm doing it. I'm totally focused on this one thing. If I don't have that much going on, what is this, lint? Um, it causes me to procrastinate. There's no luxury in procrastinating. It's a horrible sickness. You know, nobody, I don't feel good taking an hour to write a fucking email. I do not, it's terrible. And sometimes I go like, you know, as a writing exercise, here's 15 minutes, just write. Just write. Inevitably, you will stumble upon something. And I feel like the busier I am, or the more I'm able to focus on the one thing that I'm doing, uh, the healthier I feel. So when you, when I put myself in a situation where it's like, it's wrestling, you have a bunch of shit to remember, you don't know how the crowd's gonna be. I mean, why do I go out there and and barely have a promo in my head? And I would like to apologize to everyone in this building for this match even happening. And I'd especially like to apologize for the existence of David Arquette. What's the point of it being live? You want to see a little, like, on the tightrope. You want to see, like, oh, I might fall. And then people like re being reminded of that. I know improvising seems like a guy who just shows up and he's like, fucking whatever. But, you know, the people who can improvise well always, uh, I realized, were like the most prepared people. <laughs> they knew everything. Director! Switch the camera to! Somebody said that I, with wrestling, I like to deconstruct from the inside. And I think that's true. I like to become a part of it and then start picking away at the wallpaper, I guess. You remember when you watched wrestling? When you're eight years old, the most ridiculous things would happen. You would never question it. Papa Shango could light a man's boots on fire. Couldn't win a match. Never questioned it. Why would IRS moonlight as a wrestler? when he has a stable, steady job with benefits. <laughs> <laughs>dance for them and want to make you do what they want you to do 
and say, no, nah, I want you to do it like this. You do that everywhere else. I want you to do it. Yeah, but it's like, yeah, but like, this is my act. Like, this is my shit. I want to, you know, whatever. Um, you wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't book like, you know, a, a, a cerebral political comedian or whatever, and then book him on your stage and say, here's, here's a trunk of props. I want prop comedy. It's like, no, nah, you but this is my shit. And you know it. And you just, so there's certain bookers when they try to make you do that. And when they get that involved in making their mark. I realize, oh, you're just upset that you didn't become a wrestler when you had the chance to. And and this is how you're getting it out. You're saying, I can't be them, but I can control them. And it's really shitty to deal with. It happens a lot. Having said that, there are other bookers who totally get it. Dreamer said, I'm doing the show here, and I want to have you on. And he said, I don't want you to have a match, which is the story of my life. He said, I want you to come out as like a surprise. And he said, if you want to do it, great. If not, you can go fuck yourself. And I thought, you know, what a fantastic way to live your life. He had me on the phone and he was like, uh, this is our plan. We want to do this. Uh, it's the indie, so it might happen, it might not. Stuff might get switched around and blah, 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 blah. And then we got to the show and it ended up changing, I think three or four times. And not once was he bent out of shape or angry about everything changing. He was calm and would talk to you like, and I was like, oh my God, yeah, there's another way to do this. And it's a, it's a pretty reasonable way because on the indies and whatever, it's, it's hard to throw together. Stuff changes all the time. People show up, they don't show up. And he was just like, you know, just relaxed. Like the insanity was just all moving around him. And he was kind of like, oh yeah, there's no need to yell. And there's someone like that is like a, a role model for me where I'm like, I, I don't need to get bent out of shape. He still put on like an amazing show. <laughs> and didn't yell once. And then there'll be a guy running a show, you know, a tenth the size of that. And he's got this giant vein in his forehead and he's crinkling up his booking sheet. And, all, and it's like, man, just, just, you know, relax. And I, it makes me go, oh, yeah, like nothing gets done quicker by you being angry about it. It really, really doesn't. And that's, you know, not just a wrestling lesson. It's a life lesson that, like, that shit is applicable all across the board. But especially in those, like, hectic situations, it's like you look for the calm people. And you're like, thank you. Dreamer was such an easy guy to work with, such a mellow fellow. And at first you think, well, he's not bothered by life. He's not a crazy guy. And I say, au contraire. He is so crazy that he's fucking used to it. He is casually crazy. And that is the best kind of crazy that you want to be. Why did we decide to come here? And as you can tell, people are just missing it. I'm very upset that I have to stand out here. The golden mane covered in blood. It was always interesting to me when a heel would come out and, and be in the bad mood already. He would start in bad mood and he'd come out and say, I don't like this town. I don't want to be here. I hate all these people. And I thought, why would I dislike this person if he's in a bad mood? Because I think about people that I hate. And when I hate them, it's usually when they're incredibly happy. When they're in a, when they come and they're in and they go, I won the lottery. I go, I fucking hate this person. I don't like them. And now they have $100,000. I hate them even more. But if they if I see them and they're in a bad mood, if I see them and they fell in a puddle and whatever, I go, uh, this is great for me. So why would I boo you when you're already upset? So I always wanted to come out as pleased with myself as possible and seemingly composed as possible. And that's what people want to undo. It's that we're not composed and we want to be composed. And seeing someone composed is a reminder that we are not composed. That's why there's been so many rich heel gimmicks. Who wears all the gold and all the jewelry? Who wears custom made clothes? Who dates any woman he wants to on any night of the week? On any week of the month? On any month of the year? Ric Flair! Well, I, I, evidently, Everyone hates you because they also wanted a great suit. Who knew? I don't care about suits, but uh, obviously people do. And then that's why 
there's so many like you know blue collar relatable baby faces but that's the rosie with hard times and the way the the country is nowadays where we all got uh, pulled together the blacks the whites the green red purple yellow all the different people races creeds and color got to pull together and they behind one thing and that's a hero this is the guy for me so, and then you go fuck the suits but usually when people say fuck the suits they, they like them they're just pissed that they don't have them my beautiful blonde hair blowing in the breeze my five six seven eight thousand dollar robes I don't want any of you girls touching my clothes. I don't want any of you running your fingers through my hair. Being a heel and I think being a comedian are very similar. And when someone wants to be inappropriate as a comedian, and I don't mean inappropriate in a dirty sense or whatever, when they want to say a remark that's funny, the reason that it's funny is because it's incongruent with everything else that's going on. There are a lot of lovely looking ladies in this building tonight. What's your name? Oh, I'm sorry, you look way better from up there. Talk, come on, that's not funny. As a heel, I want to say to myself, what do these people want to see? And how can I not give it to them? How can I be the absolute opposite of what they want? And luckily for me, people usually want to see grit, determination, athleticism, acrobatics, things of that nature, like cool kind of things, what they deem to be cool. However, uh, rock music, aggression, all that stuff, uh, some real alpha male business. And it's my job to try to be, I guess, uh, as, as passive as possible. You have to say like, what can I bring that no one else is bringing? And usually uh, that seems to be some level of absurdist comedy and fine, whatever. If they were all absurdist comedy, like maybe then I would chain wrestle. <laughs> like I'm just trying to react to what else is there and trying to fill out the show. So, I mean, it's good for, for me, number one, because I know I'm not stepping on anyone's toes. And it's also good for the fans and it's a palate cleanser for the other stuff and when everyone else is being like intense and yelling and you know their foreheads are touching each other i'm like okay like let's do something different that's a big word colloquial yeah. colloquial is like informal you know what i mean it wasn't so why, a big why didn't deal you just say it wasn't a big deal because i'm trying to explain listen if you want to get signed you're gonna have to learn a couple words Coleco or whatever yes coleco vision Calico. that's exactly yeah, what yeah, it was. I know that one. yes colloquial Wow. Fascinating. Won't even meet me halfway. <laughs> it's over. All right. And the ultimate wrestling picture is this. They have the fist or the, the point. If they're with someone and they'll just they'll hold up their fist and try to look tough. Or if you're lucky, you'll get that one where they put you in a headlock. That one's fun. And I thought to myself, what is a pose that I have not seen? And what is the least wrestling pose? And let's go that way. And the answer is this. And I thought, well... Let's just do it all the time. You know, you know you're over if someone can imitate your entrance. You're doing something specific that can resonate with people and they can emulate it because they, they intuitively understand, you know, what it is. And there are people like, you know, somebody does an impression of Randy Savage. There's a million distinct, really distinct mannerisms that people are picking up on. Or Hulk Hogan or The Ultimate Warrior or The Undertaker or whatever. And thought oh gee like how can i make everything a thing you know what can i do every time how do i get in the ring how do i walk up the steps to get in the ring how like what is my second when i come through the curtain you know um so that stuff became i became very obsessive with that like how do you color that stuff in and we always you know take pictures with people i'm like what can i do that's like no one else seems to be doing and it turned out to be that. That's That was all that was left uh, when I got there. That was the last pose that was in the bin. And that's what I took.
the joke about me is that I'm some people's uh, favorite wrestler that they've never seen. They don't. They don't need to see me wrestle. They just see me on Twitter. Or the the other joke is, and I've perpetuated it myself, that I either don't wrestle or I'm a bad wrestler or you know whatever. None of you came here to see wrestling. All of you are in this building to hear me sing. Mountains of Virginia on the trail of the lonesome pine. I think that's all the public domain songs. I know. The, these people across from us, it reminds me, you know, they're trying very hard and they're going to create something they like. Will it be successful? Probably not. And that's what I relate to. There's that wonderful thing about wrestling where it is intangible and it is opinion based. And a good wrestler doesn't necessarily mean a successful wrestler. And a successful wrestler doesn't necessarily mean a good wrestler. Some people say, I'm a great wrestler. And it's why. You say, I have all this money in my bank account. It doesn't necessarily mean you're good. It just means you have a lot of money. Anyway. You could be both good and successful. That's totally possible. You could also be both bad and unsuccessful. That's very possible too. And then, But there's some people, and wrestling is weird sometimes, where you can be both good and bad at the same time. The same way that, you know, I liken it to like early punk music, like the New York Dolls and Lou Reed, where it's like, you guys don't really know how to play guitar, do you? And they're like, nope, we're doing what we want. And that's kind of the point. Maybe we just want to see people enjoying themselves and doing what feels right to them. And maybe the answer is there really is no definition of what's a good actor or what's a good musician and certainly what's a good wrestler. I love saying stuff like, um, I, I mean, the match was really good, but it was boring. <laughs> so what, so what does that, what does that mean? And we are uh, spoiled in a sense where there's a lot of wrestling out there. Um, and there's a lot of, of, what we've come to know as great matches, so maybe we don't see them as great matches anymore. And maybe we go the other way, just the same way that people were into, uh, I don't know, doo-wop. <laughs> and then there was a lot of doo-wop. You know, there'd be doo-wop groups on the street corner. And it's like, well, now everyone's doing this shit because they caught on. It's like, okay, what else is there? And then someone picks up a guitar and plugs it in. And you're like, oh, and then that changes. And it changes into, you know, something else. So I try to pride myself on being both good and bad at the same time, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Also, another person who's good and bad at the same time is Ethel Merman, who I'm obsessed with. She she just sang loud. Let me call you sweetheart. I certainly wouldn't call her versatile or nuanced. She had a thing. She loved doing the thing. And she did her thing. Now make me proud and sing it loud and we'll both sing together again. With wrestling that bad and good, there's toughness and that display of toughness. And then there's these incredible uh, displays of pain and defeat and submission to someone else that's more powerful than you. And so we're doing everything. And some people only identify and they say, well, that's the real me is the tough guy. But I'm like, yeah, but no, but like you sold too. <laughs> when I hit you, you did a great job of acting like you were really hurting and then I was really tough. So like that part is also in you too. What do you mean? And it's so funny to see what aspects people define themselves with when it turns out really doing all of it. Everything is ridiculous, so everyone might as well be welcome to the party. It's it's a lot uh, more interesting that way. Why would I just want to talk to one kind of person? It certainly keeps me from getting bored. It's hard to say that uh, including everyone is a bad idea. I don't see how it's a bad idea. Uh, they talk about like representation and, and being able to see themselves in movies and whatever, and I'm just like, I was a Bret Hart fan because he had black hair like I did. I was like, shit, this is my guy because we have the same color hair. So I can only imagine, you know, it must be horrible for people who don't or haven't gotten to see themselves um, 
represented on screen or in wrestling shows and it's different now so you know hopefully more and more people will wrestle sure there will be more and more shit that there were always shitty matches there were always you know shit guys um but then there'll be some really like bright spots and it'll encourage more people to do it and and the more chances people have at bat the more home runs they'll get of course there'll be more strikes but there'll also be more home runs you know also when has wrestling ever been burdened by quality that would that would be my question when are we concerned about that wrestling can be whatever the fuck you want it to be there's no rules there's no rules now there's never been rules really they would be you know if we think back like 100 years ago they were wrestling bears that's it the roof is off <laughs> you know what are we what, what are we talking about what going back to what i always hate when people go oh back when the, the way the business used to be it tells me number one their ignorance and number two they have no idea of the history of wrestling they don't in 1925 the new york times did not want to publish uh results of wrestling matches because they knew it was a work so i go what so what are we pretending this business has literally all shapes and sizes all different people whether you're a legitimate wrestler like a Luthez, or you're some crazy freak guy like uh, the French Angel or like Wild Bull Curry, just like weird looking guys and whatever, it can literally be anything. So when people get upset, it's it's pretty retroactive. They should have got upset like a hundred years ago. But people always want to go, this is the real wrestling. Look out below! Oh, oh. an elbow smash. I get pushback from certain people, usually fans and wrestlers who clung very tightly to that idea that it's a badge of honor and toughness and whatever. And I mean, it is, I just don't think uh, the business should function like that. I, you know, it can be a better play. And But having said that, the people I have worked with that have made a lot of money the more money that they've made, generally speaking, the safer they've been in the ring and the smarter they've been in the ring. And I was like, oh, okay. I understand what's going on here. Th those are the people that I look up to and go, that's who I want to be. Uh, the only time that uh, an injury can be really serious to my way of thinking is if you have bad concussions. Somebody said about me once, it was, it was an old wrestler who was just wrestling sporadically and no, he was managing now and then they were like oh do you want to get her in the ring and he said uh i would always get in the ring with rj because i know there's no way i'm getting hurt for a wrestler that's a pretty comforting thing you know to go i'm gonna i'm gonna wrestle this person and i'm not gonna get like wrestling hurts period <laughs> wrestling hurts when it goes well To have a person that you know won't go out of his way to hurt you is pretty good, I think. People say less is more. And the problem with that phrase is less is more. That implies that more is actually the best and that less is only good because it is more doesn't make any sense the the real saying should just be less is best or just less <laughs> we can just say less people would do a move or people say a joke and it would have gotten a better reaction or a more fuller reaction if we gave it a second to breathe there's a certain level of digestibility that i think is important you want to give it in a way that everyone can can absorb it and that doesn't mean you know oh back in my day a headlock used to be a finishing move and it's whatever like the business evolves it gets layered it it grows and people want to do more and more that's great but when you are stepping on your own stuff not really doing yourself a service or your work if you hit this amazing move and they pop and then you pick the guy up and hit him with something else that's shittier 
what happened? One of the first move was great. What do you? You just blew your first move, you know. Um, similarly, sometimes when I do videos or tweets or whatever, I'm like, you tweeted, just let the tweet go, give it a second. Sometimes I'm big on, uh, I'll delete tweets. If I put something out there and it's like fucking crickets, I'm like, you know, I'm like, uh, I'll think of something else that's better. There you go. You get it. <laughs> There's stuff you put out where you go, when you do something, it's gone. It's no longer yours. And we talked about that the last time. As they say, when your work goes out, it's no longer yours. Your art, this is your art. Other people interpret it, you know. But when you put it online, it's not gone. The, uh, um... Megazord of idiocy or whatever. Remember that comment, the group stupidity? The more people are together, the dumber collectively that they are. So like, you know, one person is, is kind of stupid. Five people is more dumb, 10 people is dumb. When you got, you know, 500 to 1,000, that's like a mob. They call them a mob. You know, mobs are inherently stupid. You send me the clip and I put it out and it just went really well and it had like 50,000 views or whatever. I was like, oh, that's great. The fucking beginning of this week, Somebody retweeted it again. They're like, I'm retweeting it again because people deserve to hear it. And then all these people jumped on it again. And it's like, oh, yeah, it's not really gone. You know, the whole Frankenstein thing. They were dumb. If it was just one of them, they were like, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't go after this monster with the torch. Maybe we're going to get our asses kicked. But when you have all these villagers, they're like, wow, we can all take them together. And they're like, yeah, because they forget. They make a megazord of idiocy. And they forget how stupid they are. You know, people now are living to their 90s and 100, almost like no problem. It's not a miracle to be 100 years old anymore, right? There's people, there's average ass people. You're not making the fucking paper. And I go, gee, by the time we're old, if the life expectancy keeps increasing, we'll be living to like 115, 120. Can you imagine getting to your 80s and having another 40 years to go? Like, ugh, like what are you gonna do? So talk about less. <laughs> More is not always better. I gotta walk around a food court, you know, doing laps, wearing beige and uh, white Velcro shoes for 40 years? Are you out of your mind? Maybe that's, you know, maybe by 85, I'll take a look around and I go, I don't think we're gonna make any progress beyond this. What are we doing here? Well, uh, we're supposed to have coffee in our underwear. I, I'm in mine. I got these fun little polka dot things. And you have, uh, well, you're a bit of a fleece guy. You like to sleep in the camo fleece. <clears throat> That's fine. Yeah, oh, hey. Love the polka dots. <laughs> we're not doing coffee in our underwear. Okay. That's the bottom line. You can see yourself to the front door. Thank you. I'm going to go out this way. Sounds good. Don't mess with my beer. I won't touch your beer. Goodbye. Bye, sir. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, you're welcome. Everyone is trying to be mainstream, and it doesn't it doesn't exist anymore. That happens for a few people, but even then, there's people... If there's a fucking... If you're a celebrity, but you have to say a uh, social, uh, social media app in front of your name before you say celebrity, this is a, a TikTok celebrity, this is a YouTube celebrity, this is an Instagram star, it's like, then you're not. You know what I mean? Like... But, and that doesn't, it's not bad. It's just the way it is. Like everything broke up because everyone has access to the exact same technology, especially when everyone's been driven into their homes and we've now become like everyone has a webcam and like CNN interviews people and their Wi Fi is shit and they lag. And I go, thank God. I don't feel bad about my shit. Everyone has to do this. Everyone's going through this. Like we're all on, they democratize the technology. Do you, are you familiar with? After you drink something? Mm. Mm? Mm. Ah. I want to say thank you. Thank you. For popping out of the grounds and coming by and taking the coffee. You offered it. I'm, no, I'm just. That's how I Well, you took it. I'm saying you took it. Imagine if I offered it and you said no, I'd be insulted. Yes, then it would be and RJ City standing here in his underwear for no reason. Before. Well, which is usually what I do every Sunday. Some of that is very good, and some of that is, is bad. That's just the way it is, right? You'll get to see people who probably wouldn't have gotten a shot otherwise. They put their stuff out there and it, you know, 
is great or is new and you've never seen it before, it also makes the average, I think, a little lower, <laughs> right? If a thousand people have a shot at doing something, you might have some really big hits that you've never seen before, but also maybe it'll just be a little less, myself included. <laughs> Who knows if it was like if you had to film on eight millimeter or whatever, would I be doing anything I'm doing now? Probably not. I'm going to be on the new season of um, Better Things with Pam Adlon. Yes. Do you know that show? It's on the CW. No, you fucking moron! It's on the FX. Oh yes. I love we go with the duck before it's on the on the, on the, the, on the one, CW. That it's on the FX. FX. The one FX. So Italian. Is it on the um? What's he doing? It's on. It's on the FX, isn't it? problem is there was a lot of shame around not knowing something that people are going you're either right or you're wrong you're either doing this or you're, you're either succeeding or you're failing and I find that a lot of people are incapable of expressing it three-dimensionally and maybe the answer is you do not know I cannot comment on that because I have no experience and you're like well that's a valid answer. I admire a person who is at least aware of what they don't know. But so many people want an answer, even when they don't have one. So that they'll scramble for shit, and they'll listen to people who sound like they have an answer, when they really don't. Like these motivational people who will shout it from their fucking TED Talks. They just have this shitty little earpiece, and they have a graph and shit, you know? These actionable words. They're like, yeah, huh? What about this? And I mean, I guess it's okay, but it bothers me when I feel like it starts fucking with people's lives. And, and people blind themselves to their realities or blind themselves to the reality of admitting that they're wrong or admitting that they made a mistake or admitting that they don't know. And I go, you're just really amplifying ignorance through some fucking quotes. And I'm like, that's kind of dangerous. And I always feel like these motivational people, these motivation, like motivational celebrity kind of things, um, when shit goes wrong, they seem to bear no responsibility for it. <laughs> They'll shout the good shit and then that's kind of it. And then they'll be gone. They'll be on to like something else, you know? And I, I, I don't know. That stuff just bothers me because the reason it bothers me is because like I went through shit where I was like, you know what? Fucking, I'm desperate. I'm in a shitty place. Let's see what these people have to offer. And I made it a, basically a, a hobby one summer to read these self-help books and to listen to these people and whatever. And it seems like all great pieces of the puzzle. And then you get home and you have them and you're like, well, these, these are fucking useless. These don't make a puzzle at all. This is just really detached from reality. Is, and But not in a fun way. Like it's not in a fun wrestling way where you can shut it off and then go do whatever. They're supposed to be giving you tools for reality. That's kind of what they're selling. And then you get all the tools and you can't build shit with them. And I'm like, well, that's kind of fucking nice thing to do you know the, i think the real answer is bullshit is wherever always 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 there's always stupid stuff and you also idealize everything in your head always no matter what it is it's and that's kind of this is that's the opposite end of of anxiety and i feel like a pessimistic person or a person who's cynical all the time, I think George Carlin said it, is that a, a, a cynic is was a disappointed optimist. And there is so much of like, I'm gonna do this, and it's gonna be yes, and this is gonna happen, and then yes, and then it's not. And then at this point, your body goes, now listen, you've been disappointed quite a few times before. May I suggest we anticipate the disappointment? That way, if you become disappointed, you're already prepared for it. And I always say, always go in expecting the worst. That way, worst case scenario, you break even. And I go, this date, this date went poorly. I expected it to go poorly. 
I've lost nothing, so I've gone in with nothing. Not necessarily true, but it is good to know, you know, what all the possibilities are. I think that's important. Uh, I find uh, shallow positivity nauseating, sad, infuriating. My mom sometimes watches my YouTube content. I, she does not come to wrestling shows. She's come to a handful of them, nor do I want her to come. I want to make that clear. I don't really watch the matches. No, but in, okay, let's be honest. In the beginning, I did in the most shithole of places you could possibly imagine. Okay. I'm not okay. going to mention right. any names where you would look around and maybe in the whole um, shit place, if you added everyone together, there maybe were three teeth. And I used to sit there. My mother will, will say things, but uh, passive aggressively. I always thought you would have been a good teacher. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a, it was a good way to send that message. Okay. Or a doctor, you're great with children if you're a pediatrician or something. It ain't easy having kids. It alters the rest of your life. So think long and hard. And it's no joke either. This is what you have to think about when you want to have kids. Go adopt a beautiful little kitten. Oh, God. Wait, wait, you're in the way. See? <laughs> They're singing. The weird thing about going after your dream of being a wrestler and then you do become a wrestler and you always want to do comedy and then I'm doing comedy is that sometimes you get to this stage where you're like, I'm here, I made it. And then this little light bulb goes on my head and I'm like, oh shit, I reached my dream. Uh, maybe I should have jumped to something better. Maybe they're right. Maybe I could have been, maybe I could have been a doctor or a lawyer or something. This is not the childhood dream. I'm packing my stuff and going, oh, I haven't opened this in eight months. That's not the childhood dream at all. <laughs> Nor did I think, oh my, things I, I wear, I'm gonna have to carry them with me. That wasn't part of the dream. Maybe the dream was messed up. I would, I would say, um, I'm living my childhood dream, uh, yet I'm discovering that when I was a child, I was an idiot. And that's pretty much it. And it is, it's fun to me We are like, it, this is what you wanted, right? I'm like, yep. And I had no concept it would be like this. Back to less is more. This is what happens when you have more. It just sits. What am I gonna do with his? I don't need his, you know? And I thought we were gonna use it on his word and now I have it here. He's occupied so much space in his own life that it's now overflowed into my life. Uh, this is like a storage unit for him. Stupid shirts. Yeah, I think you can always find some element of romanticism in pro wrestling, which probably makes it difficult to let go of. I always, I'm like, you know what? I would love to uh, plan a match, have the match, and talk about the match for like five minutes after. Like, that's what I love. I could lose absolutely everything else. So there's obviously enough pull in it for a lot of people that I think uh, overrides the push aspects that would keep you away from doing it. There is a lot of uh, bullshit to put up with. There is, but I guess, you know, in all life, I think about like, oh yeah, if you didn't, uh, oh man, if I wasn't in wrestling, I wouldn't have to deal with these stupid people or whatever. And then the answer is like, no, nah, no, nah, there's stupid people everywhere. There's bullshit everywhere. So, you know, find something that you enjoy. I feel like there is a scenario of my life where I am, I don't know, a, a grade school teacher or something, and I have all the exact same complaints, yet nothing that I enjoy in it. <laughs> um, look, and I respect our teachers. I love them. But I just go, oh, yeah, like, find the stuff that you want to do because you're going to hit bullshit no matter what.
uh, you can hate what you do and still encounter the same amount of bullshit. So it's romantic, yet I find that all romantic love is dwindling. It's not necessarily the most stable kind of love. Romance is nice, but like all things, it's very uh, fleeting. And you must make sure that if you're in a long-term relationship, it's uh, someone, you know, 12 years from now that you still want to wake up to. I think that's, that's the important thing. When they don't buy you roses anymore. I'm a hoot. I'm a catch. I want that to be known. I've also heard uh, from multiple people, you'd be hot if you just shut the fuck up, which is, is certainly something I've, you know, considered and appreciated. It's a sweet thing to say to someone. It ultimately comes from a good place. This is the ending. He dragged you all the way out here to just to film this in front of this. This is it. We're done. Goodbye.